school. Any places that are not Rob's apartment. It's Rob has a podcast, and we are here to discuss episode 8 of season 28 of The Amazing Race, and obviously I am not Rob's just you know. But you guys know me because I'm here every week. My name is Jessica Lee, and with me this week are some very special guests. We have to get two guys to replace one Rob, but they're pretty great guys. And I'm sure you will agree, we're going to have a lot of fun tonight as we discuss everything that happened in Dubai. So please welcome to the Rob Has a Podcast main stage, the two guys that have helped me out on Amazing Race stuff for years and years and years. We have the wonderful co-host of the Amazing Race Canada podcast, Mr. Dan Heaton. Hello, Dan. Hello, Jess. Oh, I am sorry. thrilled to be here as half of Rob. Excellent. And the other half of Rob, representing the now defunct third Fantasy Amazing Race team, the one and only Mike Bloom. I was going to wear my black flannel, but I feared that Dana would hate tweet me, so I, I settled for this outfit, and I'm feeling very comfortable, I might say. It's got to be spring temperatures in New York, and I'm feeling the heat, so I decided to dial back appropriately. Well, that, that's good, because I don't think we really want to do anything to provoke Dana. She's had a hard enough time of it as it is. Yeah, she's going to call me uh, ludicrous, and she's going to call me psychotic, so I, you know, I get enough of that from other people on the internet. Let's, let's, I'll have Dana steer clear of that. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's a pretty good idea. So, you know, non-elimination, but still pretty eventful. Okay, I would say. Well, okay, okay. I think we're going to say, uh, 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 and that would be the epic data in that meltdown. So we should probably just go ahead and start there. Like, it looked like things were going better for them recently. I'm not sure exactly what happened here. It was weird. I didn't. Like, there was a little argument with the camels, and then I guess he wasn't hearing her directions, and it was one of the stranger arguments I've ever seen on The Amazing Race. Like, I still yeah. don't really know. Well, the problem was, okay, and I, I, I want to be fair to both parties here, but in my opinion tonight, Dana sounded like a sourpuss, due to the fact that she was complaining about Matt not complaining when they were in the desert. And, when, and I can understand, you're on a very exhausting journey around the world, but when it gets to a certain point when you are yelling at your partner for not sympathizing with you, uh, it's it's kind of boiling things down to semantics, and it seemed like their main conflict at the end of the episode just boiled down to the fact that she was giving directions, he was confused by the directions, but she took it as like an affront to her. But on the one hand, I can completely understand where she's coming from in terms of it feels like a mental roadblock and not and nothing involving you know putting together a puzzle, a little puzzle in loose quotations that I'm sure we'll talk about later. But on the other hand, I do feel like, I don't know, I, I might have to take his side from this perspective just because the things that she was finding fault with didn't seem that legitimate, in my opinion. So, are we, are we saying, like, who do we think this reminds us most of? Because I was thinking, I was thinking Brendan and Rachel for a while, and then, like, the, there's a little tinge of the Haley, I'm always right, and you never listen in there. Mm -hmm. But... I don't know. I it seemed like at a certain point it almost I thought for a second that they were done. That they were completely hundred percent done. Yeah, I wondered if they were gonna quit. And I know once it went to commercials we had to probably assume they wouldn't, but I wonder if this has gone on for I mean, they've shown little bits of it, but I think him like she was telling him, Go to the left and he was just like not hearing her and I think this was just like probably a lot of things we never saw with him just not understanding things like which way to walk or drive. But it it seemed like she was losing her mind. But it might maybe it was the quote unquote puzzle that got her in that zone going in. Yeah. No. I mean, if you're asking about who to compare it to, I mean, I know not. I don't know who out there watched Amazing Race Canada three alongside the three of us. But I'm trying to remember that that dancing team, right? The ones that were on the most recent season. They quit, or they like they they had that thing where they had to like go through that military obstacle course, and they like had a furious falling out, and then uh, they sort yes. of quit. And by quit, I, they just sort of like gave up the race. So it's sort of is talking about what you just mentioned, Dan. If there might have been a chance, if they had actually done that, they probably 
probably would have been closer to that example. Whereas I think what you're alluding to, Jess, is like she's the data is sort of like a best of mixtape of all the the racer meltdowns we've experienced thus far. We got a little bit of Rachel Riley, we got a little bit of you know, we got a little bit of Colin mixed in there, uh, considering how much she was freaking out at the puzzle. We got Haley in there, so I feel like she's sort of a a blended mix of all the racer freakouts we've had over the past twenty seven seasons. It's like they grew her in a lab. <laughs> so she's the she's the test two baby of Amazing Race twenty eight. Well, the amazing thing is, like we've seen little hints of this before, but we have not seen a full on freak out from her. Like she does get a little snippy at points, but I really, it seems like we should have been talking about them a lot more before this point. And this is like the first time I think, like we've got whole episodes where Rob and I have not even brought up their names, and it seems very like we know what kind of person she is, we know how she reacts to things, but it's still seemed kind of almost out of nowhere. Yeah, and it's it was even hotter because I even earlier in the episode I was I had written something down like, Wow, they're really doing well. They seem like they're they're killing it today and then like five minutes later she's like, We're done. I'm quitting. Don't talk to me. It's like wait, well what what happened? So I don't know. It's it's a weird one and then she was really happy when she had the milk, and then a second later was mad, and then happy. It's all over the map. I don't understand. Well, I mean, I think if you, I feel like you have to chalk it up to the conditions from one perspective, but I want to go back to what you said before, Jess, about how when you and Rob in the past few weeks have sort of been like, yeah, and Dana and Matt, yada, 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 which I would say kind of boils down to my general thoughts about this season thus far, which is, you know, again, low expectations. It has surpassed them. I do feel like the first half of this race, like episodes one through six, in my opinion, weren't stellar just because, I don't know, the things that I enjoy about Amazing Race are getting to know these teams and for to get to know these relationships. One of the cons of having people who are so famous online is that the editors feel like they don't need to tell these stories. You already know who Tyler Oakley is, so we don't need to have him describe himself, essentially. But the problem is, I don't know who Tyler Oakley is. I want to know who this guy is, besides he wears glasses and has quips and has his hair surprisingly quaffed in 100-degree heat. Uh, you know, but the I feel, crazy thing is, though, I feel like I know Tyler better than I know, like, any of the couple teams. Yeah, I could, yeah, and that's the problem, is that, like, Tyler, because Tyler's such a soundbite machine, they kept going back to him, but, you know, you look at people like Bernie and Ashley had a couple moments, but then, like, Zach and Rachel just showed up last week, and then we have Matt and Dana coming back into prominence. I feel like once they came back from this three long week break. I don't know. I don't know if the editors got like a shot in the ass if they had to race a camel at 40 miles an hour or something, but I feel like they got some new energy in them and now they're starting to like really show all the teams because I feel like these past two episodes, last episode and this were by far the two best of the season in my opinion. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think we're finally hitting our stride and I think it's disappointing that it's taken us eight episodes to get there, but I hope we don't lose any of that momentum going forward. Right, because the episode right after the hiatus, I was really bored. And I like the teams. They were they they're nice people. They they laugh a lot. They all seem to be enjoying it. They're not well, I mean a few of them are kind of one's kinda of loud. But um you know but overall I like the teams. But you it doesn't matter how much I like them. If they're doing boring, dumb tasks, it doesn't matter. But I feel like they really have. This week was fun. This, unfortunately, the end kind of killed the stakes. But um, the last few weeks have been better. But still, better meaning okay. You know, yeah, you know likable I, teams. i got to be honest. I was really concerned when I saw Dubai. I'm thinking, like, how many times have they been to Dubai? This has got to be, like, the third or fourth time. And yeah. What is there possibly for them to do that they haven't already covered a million times? We even go back to the exact same resort that we were at in season 15. And I was thinking this is going to be a snooze. But even with some kind of flat tasks that we can kind of, we'll go task by task. But I felt like this was, you know, we kept up the momentum from last week. And they had tasks that were interesting to watch and highlighted the local culture, which I always love. And it's like you said, Dan, the teams are kind of carrying us now because they're interesting people, and you give them something good to do, it makes good television. Yeah, and I think the biggest point this week, too, is that they let them drive. 
And I think that almost always makes for, and you saw at the end, well, I mean, not to jump ahead too much, but mm-hmm. uh, Sherry saying, well, I don't want to drive. It's like, no, that makes for fun, amazing race because crazy stuff can happen. Oh, yeah, so and that's funny this week. It was like, um, people would say crazy things that if they say that they don't want to do it. It's like, but you're on the amazing race. Like, you don't want to drive, but you're on the amazing race. You don't like being challenged, but you're on the amazing race. Yeah, and as I mean, as fun as we got to see like Tyler and Corey's cab driver go malicious and just probably mow down a few people on the sidewalk last round, I do feel like there, at least to me, I love the self driving element as well because it really ties into this main element of the Amazing Race, which is like basically j- traveling the world yourself uh, with a camera crew and with the, you know within the blinders of a competition sense, but still you're like making your own, own way through the world. And it also leads to much more placement shifting, in my opinion. Granted, I do feel like as exciting as the task in this episode may have been, it was sort of a, okay, let's see if Sherry and Cole can basically get up to, to catch up to anybody at this point, which, of course, the answer was no. Uh, but I like how, you know, Zach and Rachel weren't first, but then they passed the camel racing, and so they came in fourth. You know, I feel like self-driving and self-navigating, more often than the taxi drivers, in my opinion, lead to some more of that shakeup. Yeah, yeah, and it makes it more like, you know, if you're not going to places, if you're not navigating, you might as well be on a soundstage, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Which, again, these people are very used to, and I think one of the concepts, maybe one of the darker concepts that Phil decided when they, the producers decided on the show was like, let's bring these people out of their, their comfort zone and see what happens. And I think people like Dana took that bait because I don't think she would regularly have these screaming fits on her YouTube channel, or if she did, she would edit it out. But it's interesting. I mean, I think it speaks to a larger question of, like, overall, outside of the Dana and Matt stuff, is anyone else really getting a negative edit? I mean, I know some people have, like, com- complained about people like like Blair. We might be able to complain about people like Cole and Brody for being loud. But outside of that, I don't think we've really seen that much negative stuff coming out of any of these teams so far. Yeah, and I agree. I think that that might be one reason that they're, I mean, should I think they're nice people, but it does seem like, and that's why this week seemed kind of out of nowhere, is that the editors may be, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I'm not saying it's a conspiracy, but they may be trying to present a more happy, fun race because we. I feel like there were a few episodes in the beginning where it was just people laughing and screaming and going, woo! And that's, that's what most of the... And it's fun, but they're really trying to make it that way. And it could just be this cast is fun. I mean, Tyler, I don't think they have to do anything to make him get excited and laugh and stuff. That's just him. But you're right, it's, it's not... And I've criticized them in the past for focusing too much on conflict and drama. But this might be on the other end, so I don't know. Yeah, it's really interesting, especially like when you contrast it with Survivor this season, which has gotten really personal and really snipey. It's almost like they're going out of their way to make this the happy, fun, like, lovey, snuggly show. Yeah, this is, this is, the, this is TAR Disneyland, basically, where it's like, hey... You're going to step into this season, you're not going to see any garbage, you know, everything's going to be clean, happy, fun, right? You're going to absolutely love it, you're going to walk out smiling, you're going to be ready to come back again. Uh, and I feel like, you know, the, the, the race is really trying to promote, like, the positive aspect. This is almost like the exact opposite of a major race. We talked a little bit about how, like, there's a fine line, but I know Rob, but I know I, for example, they crossed the line with me, and, like, I don't necessarily want to see people screaming at each other for an entire 42 minutes. So I feel like we need to have that fair down. Yeah, what's up, Jess? I don't know. Um, yeah. So we got everything up. And I feel like we're going to be that, you know, she might not be the worst person in another season, but it's really like there's one source of conflict, and everybody else seems to kind of be rolling with whatever's going on. Yeah, it makes me wonder about Rachel too. With I mean, her struggling with the bike riding, and then the little glimpse we saw next week. If things get tougher, we may see something where she kind of falls apart. But. Again, I think it's going to be, it's not like Zach's going to turn around and start yelling at her or something. I mean, it's going to, he's too supportive, which is good, but I think that's, that might be the only other case, but teams just are happy. Even when they finish last, they're like, oh, it was fun, you know. Even when, even when they have to wear tight as hell bathing suits that were off the set of, of, of Soul Train, they still were happy about it. 
Yeah, well, I mean, those, those suits made me happy. I, I wasn't wearing them. <laughs> Family show, Jess. Family show. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we, we do have to talk a little bit about these, about the tiny bathing suits and the whole, like, Atlantis detour, because, as you guys will recall, this is the site of one of the more infamous uh, scenes in Amazing Race history. Uh, the infamous season 15 roadblock. Um, we got to talk a little bit about Mike, the country singer, and the little trotters kind of trying to make her feel like it's a really tough thing. And I was thinking, nobody's going to do a water slide. What is this? We're going to go like through the shark part. And then they found an even scarier water slide, which made me very, very happy. Poor, poor Micah. You know that. You know that was traumatic enough, and now they have to bring it back up. Now I doubt she's watching. Yeah, no, I, to be honest, do you remember anything else about Micah and Kanan besides that? I, I guess you can balance whether you'd rather be infamously known on The Amazing Race or not known at all. But per, from my perspective, I'd rather have the former. Yeah, well, Kanan is apparently quite famous now. Like, if you're into country music, he has quite a career for himself, but, yeah, his ex-girlfriend pretty much known only for not liking water slides at this point. So, how do you think this new slide, Poseidon's Revenge, uh, which sounds a little too much like Montezuma's Revenge for my own, really does. Uh, how, do, how, does, how does that stack up to, what was it, the Leap of Faith? Does it look... As Phil says, like twice as fast and twice as scary. Would yeah. you go on it? No, no, no. Should you go on it? Absolutely. I think I did on it. No, no, no. I did on it. What do you want to do? 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 What do you So, unlike season four, they didn't just have to walk. Because I agree, like, sharks are not much to people's misconception of what Shark Week may tell you. If you're going to get in, like, a tank with a shark, he's not just going to go after you. He's not going to tear you limb from limb. Yes, you want to proceed with caution, but unless you openly just cut your arm as soon as you dive in the tank, these sharks are not coming after you. Yeah, these sharks seriously don't care if you're there. I, I actually, this is something I have done. Um, they have some shark snorkel and snuba things at Atlantis, and when we got married in the Bahamas, we went and we did some of them, and they tell you you can't, you can't approach the sharks, like, leave them alone, don't pet them, don't touch them. What they didn't tell me was that sometimes the sharks will touch you. What a double standard. Yeah, I know, right? So I'm like, paddling along, I'm looking at the fish, and all of a sudden something brushes against my leg, and the shark comes, like, right under me. 
freaked out a little bit, and the guy's like, well, I didn't say they weren't going to come to you. You just can't come to them. So I guess I'm kind of a shark whisperer in this regard, but really there's nothing scary about these guys. They're not that big. They're not that interested in you, uh, except maybe just to, like, brush up against you. So it was kind of a... It's a little bit of one of those flashy tasks, which we have a lot of, where you don't really, you know, there's not a lot of actual peril involved. It just looks kind of cool, and yeah. then you get your, what I'm given to understand, the toy that this thing is based on is called a wonderful waterfall, and I had one when I was like five, so I don't know how hard the puzzle really was, if they were just tired or what, but it looked to me like one of those little tiny wind toss things that you get babies. And yet, Brody shook it like, like almost like a caveman or a zoolander and thing or something. What, what might that say about Brody's level of intelligence at that moment? <laughs> no, that's just very difficult. But I agree. I mean, what do we define a puzzle as? I feel like a puzzle is something that tests like ingenuity and knowledge. This is more like a test of hand-eye coordination. It's essentially like, hey, line up the letters. I don't know what they could have called it besides a puzzle. Maybe just like, uh, flippy C cylinder. I don't know. This is why I don't work on the show. Um, but I, I feel like calling it a puzzle and then being like, well, Zach's really good at puzzles. Like, no, Zach's just really good with his hands because he's a magician, so he's he could very easily just figure out where the letters need to be lined up. Yeah, it was it was a test of precision, which, you know, they, they have those from time to time. Um, you see them on Survivor a lot, and they probably call them puzzles there, too. No, no, what, what, I don't know. What, what's, like, the last reward challenge, would you call what the teams did an, a puzzle? Like, oh, here comes Jason. He's solving that puzzle by knocking down those blocks off that off that ledge. Well, I think it depends on who's doing the throwing, because for some people, that probably was a puzzle. <laughs> <laughs> very true, very true. Not naming names, not calling anybody out. But <laughs> well, and also, um, it wasn't really good for TV. I mean, it was really hard. To, I guess the big question was, do you use the front or use the back? But we saw a lot of people just kind of like this, and it it was hard to really see what was happening. So that 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 kind of hurt too. Yeah, it was not the most dynamic thing. I mean, that's the problem with I would say ninety percent of televised puzzles. I'm just gonna throw it out there: puzzles are fun to do, and they're not fun to watch, pretty much ever. So I get the need to have them there for competition's sake. But, you know, I don't think anybody should be surprised when we're not all that interested in watching people do them. Well, the ESPN just withdrew their support to fund the World Series of Puzzles, thanks to you, Jess. Everyone, I just ruined it. You just ruined it. Now I have no reason to watch ESPN. So. Well, that wasn't going to yeah. be on ESPN one, mic. That was going to be on like, mm -hmm. ESPN. It was going to be on Ocho. the Ocho. Yeah, it was definitely going to be on the Ocho after the Don Call Finals. I'm saddened by the Shark Tank task because I feel like if it was on NBC, it would definitely would have been Sharknado related. If it was on ABC, you know, like Mark Cuban or Mr. Wonderful would have been there. But no, it was on CBS, so there was no synergy going on, unfortunately. Yeah, that, that is a little bit rough. Um, we have the one network with no sharks. Exactly. Even Discovery could have done something, but we've got the sharkless network. <laughs> you know, I try to live every week like it's Shark Week. <laughs> So, now is a good time to remind everybody that we have a chat room going on here at RobisWebsite.com, and we also will take questions in the chat room. We can also take them via Twitter, use the hashtag RHAP, or you can go on our YouTube screen, slash channel, slash wherever you're watching this, and leave some comments there. We have Scott, P Scott St. Pierre in the background monitoring all of your questions, and we will get to those a little bit later on in the program. But we should back up again. If we have given enough thought to the shark puzzle, the puzzle had sharks in it. You didn't have to do anything with the sharks, so I guess it's a shark puzzle. Um, and we should back up and we should talk a little bit more about this detour. Because I thought this was, this was a more interesting detour. And I was, I was very excited to see the involvement of camels who have historically been um, an excellent source of dramatic conflict and tension for Amazing Racers. But these camels seemed very well behaved. Yeah, they were very good at running. I, I did really enjoy watching the 
racers quickly realize that camels run really fast and they're not such great bike riders. So that was entertaining. And I also think the other, it was kind of a nice old school physical, you could get done fast versus slow, but kind of easy task. And I, yeah. I kind of like that. And, and people really seem to enjoy walking the camels, which I did not suspect. Those well, must have been very well-trained camels. Well, one person in particular did not like walking those camels, but I feel like everyone else did. That one shot of Brody and Kurt uh, the wide shot of Brody and Kurt versus the Camels. I know it was seen on the, like, this season on The Amazing Race, but that shot is awesome. Like, if, if the only thing we got out of that detour was that one shot, I would be totally happy, just because, yeah, it, everyone else kind of sucked on it, and at least the producers did kind of give them the, the pity thrill of, like, hey, if you lose the first time, we'll give you a head start. Otherwise, it would be, like, that one biathlon robot from Amazing Race Canada 2, where it was just like, yeah, just keep biking back and forth and shooting. That's not going to affect you at all. Uh, so I was happy about that. You might, it might seem cheap, but it's going to expedite your race a lot faster rather than leaving. Could you imagine, like, Sherry and Cole having to do that, like, five times and then get lost and then get slowed down by everything else? It would it would have been a massacre. That would have been a field elimination right there. Yeah. A field non-elimination at that. Yeah. Yeah. And field non-eliminations are kind of the worst <laughs> because it's like, well... It's the beginning of the leg, and we're 19 hours behind, but we're going to get right back in it, and then you cut to all the other racers, and it's like, hours of operation, 5.30 to 8.30 on Sundays, and it's Thursday. I guess we're going to camp out here. What a weird set of opening hours. I wonder how they stay in business. It would have been like a Nick and Vicky where when they found out they weren't eliminated, they yeah. were so disappointed. Yeah, because they, like, they quit the detour. <laughs> what are you doing to us? Um, I also liked how um, the camel part of it, remind, I'm just throwing out early season stuff again, I apologize, reminded me of season one, Kevin and Drew leading the camels in to the pit stop. And, I mean, for that first season, it, it, it felt very similar. No camel milk, though, so this is an improvement. Oh, there was camel milk. Yeah. Um, oh, you're saying no camel milk in season one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and, you know, that was that was the first place my brain went to because I was thinking about, like, how those camels really did not want to move. And right. these camels were just kind of like, yeah, all right, whatever. Also, I think every task should come with a snack. Yeah, exactly. Really like, hey. Take a break, sit down, have some bread and some milk, and then you can keep going. It's okay. You can take a break. Everyone else is. Yeah, I, I, I love that everyone was so happy to see it, too. It's just like, oh, this is delicious. What a great what a great moment for us. And it's like, well, if they'd said on the clue that this had a snack with it, I think everybody would have taken that detour. Yeah, it, it surprised me. Some of the teams, I mean, that more teams didn't switch. Well, I guess the head start made the difference, so Tyler and Corey finished. But if I had done that and been blown out by the camels, I would have been like, forget this. Let's go walk the camels. But team stuck with the bike riding. I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, I go ahead. Who did it more than twice? Like, everybody seemed yeah. to get it after they got the head start. So I think it was like only the people that were really opposed to biking like the people that were, you know, almost throwing up from it, like Ashley, or the people that have a previously undisclosed fear of going fast on bikes, like Rachel. Like, then it doesn't make sense to switch, but otherwise, like, just take your head start and, you know, accept it. Plus, right. Tyler and Corey learned last week, they almost got eliminated because they switched detours. Yeah. So I feel like they're still burning from that, even though they didn't get eliminated. So they would say, like, all right, we learned our lesson. Let's just stick with what's in front of us and keep going because we're guaranteed to do this faster than if we had switched. Yeah, well, that's yeah. the thing. Like, if you're Tyler and Corey, you're probably not switching any detour for the rest of the game. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. And, of course, I didn't know how much head start they got. I mean, it could have been, you know... <laughs> they put okay. them right before the finish line. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you know, you're, you're 100 feet away, right? And then they're like, okay, the camels go. And then they somehow use camera work to make it seem close or something. So it was probably the, it was the right idea. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so do we have anything else we want to cover about this episode before we start diving into some questions here? Should we talk about the Express Pass use? Um, yeah, we can talk about the Express Pass use because... I mean, they're getting to the point where they got to use it anyway, right? Yeah, so I guess, you know, even the other teams were wondering, was this a good move? And I think, you know, having just seen Tanner and Josh blow it 
the the previous round. I mean, I'm always of the theory with express passes that like if there's two ways you can basically use them. It's to get yourself out of a jam or to just pr- further propel yourself in first place. It seems like Brody and Kurt were doing it for the latter, even though they initially tried to make it seem like the former with like, oh no, Brody's struggling on the puzzle. But you know, at the beginning of the episode, he said he wanted another win so we could take Blair somewhere, and it looks like they're going to Helsinki. Yeah, I, I mean, unless, you know, maybe they still are, but didn't Blair kind of give it away in the exit interview that, you know, Blody is no more? Yeah, that was sad when I heard that. I was really, I thought they were in it for the long haul, really. I thought Blody was going down the aisle, they were done. I hey, thought listen. they would at least last until they had a season of returning teams. What, uh, hey, if, if, uh... Azaria and Christina from Ron and Christina got together and they got, you know, they lasted that long. You, you never know what this random team love. Uh, yeah, and by the way, if you haven't listened yet out there, listen to Rob's interview with Blair and Scott because it gives you, it, it will show you how awesome Scott is as a person. He was, he was a little low key over his time in the race, but he's, he's just fantastic. I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, he's a cool guy. It would be a shame if Lodi got to run as a team in a returning season because then we wouldn't get Scott. Yeah, yeah, because Scott really, he was like the, the superstar. His dancing last week is still one of the big surprises on the race for me. Like, when he chose it, I went, he's done. But no. Well, no. Then, then they were done. But. I mean, they were done through, you know, other things. But, yeah, he, he, had, some, he had some moves. I was impressed as well. Um... But yeah, this seemed like, on its face, maybe a little bit of an odd place to use the express pass, but they did get a little bit scared when they got stuck in the sand, and it looked like maybe, you know, you hear you hear Brody say, well, we're in the last place now, which we knew wasn't true, but I think maybe that put a little bit of the fear of God into them, and they thought, well, we just need to burn this express pass off and get back out in front any way possible, because this thing could happen again. Yeah, and I don't know how much, you know, I know there are big fans of the race. I mean, there were three of them standing today during the roadblock that pointed at the water slide and said, ha, 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 remember when we could kind of do that. But I don't know how big of a a fans Brody and Kurt are, but if they were, they could probably realize, hey, there's a good chance a double U-turn is coming up. And one of the big targets for a double U-turn usually is an express pass user because it basically forces them to burn it off. Let's get rid of this thing that, you know, that they pulled over our heads going into the next round. So that way we're on equal footing with everyone else. So arguably they have the most wins out of all the teams so far. They're still going to have a, a bounty on their heads coming into the next double U-turn. Yeah, do you think there'll be, there's going to be U-turns? Because I would assume it would come next week, but they didn't show it in the preview, I don't think. So I there was, apparently there was one on leg three that was just unaired, which I can understand with early, early U-turns, it's tough. Even if you don't know each other, uh, it's still tough because there's just, there's just so many teams. Uh, but I could see it happening, you know, if not at Final 6, definitely at Final 5. I feel like those are the prime rounds for the U-turns to come in. Uh, the Final 5 U-turn feels really late to me, but I think I think you're right. That's probably when we're going to get it. Yeah, and I, I don't like it at the 5 because I feel like it gives too much power to kick out a strong team, but it could happen. But also with the Express Pass, I think it worked too because it was so late in the leg. Like we saw last season where they used it early in the leg and then got mm-hmm. stuck. At least here they used it at the end, so they could have figured there probably wasn't, they didn't know about the water slide, but there probably wasn't going to be much more to do. Yeah, it's the, it's the equivalent of like having a drag race and then pushing out nitrous oxide at the very end to give you that final boost into the finish line. Like once you see the finish line is almost right in front of you, then it's a good time to just kind of have a guarantee to make sure you'll be able to get first place. Yeah, I mean, the other thing about making it to the U-turn is you've got to still be in the race at that point. So you might as well, like, get yourself out in front, guarantee yourself a spot in the next round, and you got to take it leg to leg. So. Anyway, I think with that covered, we can probably start moving into some questions here. And once again, you can leave those questions on our YouTube page. Um, you can leave them in the chat room at robinswebsite.com, or you can tweet them to us with the hashtag RHAP. So... We're going to start things off. Uh, Nick 2S wants to know, why were they Eskimo kissing in the desert? Oh so let's talk about that Bedouin kissing for a second, uh, or the Bedouin greeting, because there, the, people did make audible kissing noises at some point. I think maybe it was Corey first like went in for the kiss initially, 
Um, but there also was very interesting. I mean, I guess in that culture, I guess males were the only ones that are allowed to do it because I, there was a shot of like Ashley and Rachel and somebody else like standing outside the tent. I guess the males were only allowed to do the greeting. Yeah, that, that is interesting. They didn't really get into that, did they? But it seemed to me like they were kind of, it was kind of like, you know, that thing that wasps do where you do like the air kissing on the cheeks. It, it felt like maybe that was where they were going with making the kissing noises while they did it. Yeah, I also enjoyed Phil not being interested in recreating that moment. <laughs> he just kind of smiled like, yes, that's very funny. Let's move on. Well, in Phil's opinion, love died after Amazing Race 26, so he has no volition to try to push people to kiss each other at all at any point during the race. Yeah, but I think Phil should understand that love happens when you least expect it. Like, you know, he didn't do anything, and look what happened with Brody. They that's true. They together on their own, and maybe maybe that's a lesson for Phil. <laughs> do you think Phil was going to start a random showmance between Corey and the Bedouin? Um, I would ship it. What is what is their name? Betty, Corian. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't know, man. Corian isn't that like a ceramic countertop material? Yeah, um, something like that. I'm thinking like, like coriander. <laughs> coriander is a spice, so maybe it's a spicy relationship. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So uh, Scott Schieffer wants to know what would have to happen to cause Cole and Sherry to lose their amazingly positive attitudes. Um, she could have to change the car's oil again. I don't know. They, yeah, it was weird. Like, even when they, like, went to ask for directions, they were just like, hey, can you guys help us for directions that the guy was showing them? I don't know. I think, I think they're so amazed that they're still in the race that it's all gravy from now on. And, I mean, to be honest, I'm a little surprised they're still in the race. I mean, I think... I, you know, we don't need to do, like, power rankings, but I feel like of the six, the consensual pick is that they're kind of near the bottom. I mean, this is the second time they're being saved by either a non-elimination or a to-be-continued. I think that's very demonstrative of the fact that they're kind of, you know, they're they're welcoming everyone to the bottom, it seems, whenever people tend to fall behind. Yeah, it, it's true. I, I think there are, you know, of the teams that are remaining in the race, there are five that could arguably be competitive, and you have Cole and Sherry, who are still inexplicably there, and I mean, who knows? We've had seasons like this before, and that's the team that ends up winning, so I I would say anything is possible at this point, but I do agree, like, it seems like every time we see them now, in their heads, they're thinking, well, we're on television, we got to not be, you know, we got to not come off as, like, negative sourpusses, we got to not be bitter, Let's have our speech ready for Phil about how we learned a lot about each other and about the race and the world. We got it ready. We can just give it to Phil as soon as we get there. And then Phil's like, yeah, I, I don't want to hear it right now. You're still racing. That's so cynical. What are you, are you saying that these teams are trying to, you know, come up with material? What? I don't understand. You know, it, it's maybe I'm just... Maybe I'm not giving them enough credit here, Dan, but it sure feels to me like they're, the one thing that is good is that you do sometimes get teams that have no concept of how they're going to come across on television. I think with maybe one possible exception, everybody here has some idea of what they're going to look like to the viewers at home. Yeah, that's true, though. I feel like the positivity is effectively coming from, and interestingly enough, the one person who, one of the people that's not involved with that community, right? We have these sort of plus ones here where, you know, Tyler and Corey are YouTubers, but Scott was not doing YouTube videos with Blair. No, and so unfortunately. Some, some of the fun of those, of those parent-child teams in particular were that the people that were not necessarily the ones that were ready for camera and were the YouTube personalities, so I feel like they might have been more raw and, like, actual people sometimes. So, you know, you have to appreciate that Sherry, for being the one that doesn't have a camera in her face 24-7, is the one that's kind of driving the team's positivity, considering that she was, like, beaming when she got to the mat. Though that might have also been because she felt like, oh, thank God I get to go home and get a massage, you know. Oh, great, we still have to keep going. Yeah, well, Sherry has kind of worn her heart on her sleeve the entire time. Like, she is the one that's gotten a little bit sobby at things. Um, and she is a more effusive emotional person, I think, in general. But, yeah, 
and her reactions seem a little bit more natural sometimes. And I could certainly see, like, I would love to be a fly on the wall during the pit stops where they're talking about what their strategy is for the camera because you know Cole's got one. Yeah, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Yes. Okay, what are we going to do? I mean, it's not like Paul. Paul. But he's, he's won you know, eight out of nine. nine. There's yep. some. But here, and look, and look, he wins by 12 character. points. I tell you, I would not do well. As I mean, a he's not the only one that he wins by 12 points. points but it is, he may not it even pick up a single okay, delegate. Yeah, he's yeah, seven and six now. When the remaining delegate to be decided later. I'm sorry. Was that the one where he, he pushed it like that? I feel embarrassed if I got beaten by a camel and it's how it's just going to call me that. That's what we're referring to. I think she only has to win 30% of the, maybe that's going to have to get 30% of the other remaining. I think we're going to talk about what it's feeling. That's amazing. It's tough to pick. It's tough to pick. Why are you even voting? They are driving by a car right now. We are talking about winning system. We're putting up right now a graph. Bernie Sanders wins 56 to 44%. And Wyoming, the delegates were awarded. Hillary Clinton, 11. Bernie Sanders, 7. Why is the Democratic Party even have voting votes? This system is so rigged. It feels that yeah, way, and I think I agree. It, you know, I they fall into line better no, than I, our voters I, do, I but I can do, see was, some of the same dumb, emotions so boiling so over at their convention. But we always talk about voter turnout and how important it is to do community as a citizen. There's absolutely no reason any of their people voted. In yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, what's the justification? Please call and tell me. These are the rules. No, that's not a good answer. Tell me why the why those people made it to the vote. They don't vote. It doesn't matter. Because the fewer votes matter, more counted. How? Do they count in some way? How? I don't well, know only in some parts of the country it matters? System, but it's not like it's well, 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 well,
Um, I agree. I think also to ha having that. I mean, that water slide moment was pretty painful, but it is kind of an iconic moment from the show, especially with the globe trotters sitting next to her in her ear, going, "It's terrible. You don't want to do it. You don't want to do it." And then laughing. I mean, it's, it's a signature <laughs> moment. I remember that. There's plenty of things from seasons that I don't remember, and this episode I liked. I mean, I, I'll remember it. But it's, I don't think it's going to be iconic if we get to, you know, 15 seasons from now. Season, can't do the math right. Season 43 or 44, you know, as far as we get. So where are we? What are we on right now? <laughs> oh, my God. You're talking about another, like, seven, like eight or nine years of Amazing Race at this point, Dan. You are you are very positive. You keep sending those letters to, me, to CBS being like, I hope you keep Amazing Race on for season 43 or 44. And I was doing very bad math there, too, so I went from 15 to well, to 28, and somehow added 15, so I'm going to go sit. I'm just, I'm not ready for math right now, so. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to, if Dan and I ever run the Amazing Race, I'm definitely going to do all the math with Lux. That would be a mistake. Cause yeah. <laughs> but hey, if they want to go to 43 seasons, you know, bring it, because I'm going to have to put kids in college, so. <laughs> Just saying. All right, so Adam555 wants to know, what would you consider a good example of a puzzle challenge ideal for viewing in Amazing Race? A maze, maybe. That'd be fun. Yeah. Uh, right? Well, yeah. that's the survivor challenge that's always really fun to watch for me. Is the one where they well, even, yeah. even, like, the opening challenge from 27 of, like, the puzzle to, to make it look like the boardwalk on the pier. I thought that with was... A victory in the Wyoming Wyoming well. I think it's, I think it's when you do these smaller puzzles, like, I think 23, 23 right? well, four, had that one, like, that 44, one really hard puzzle. So, yeah. But then in 23, you had the final four, you had the sort of puzzle of the truck and giant figure in Japan. So I feel like, for me, for me, for me, with puzzles of amazing ways, I feel like the bigger, the better in terms of scope. Like, I want to see three something giant, something we can see rather than just like a little points. cylinder that he just may not even pick, pick up a single yeah, delegate. Yeah, Seven to six now with a remaining function. delegate to be decided yeah. later. Make it I'm something sorry. that's kind it's of a got rushing victory. I think that I know. And listen, I think that it. with the six delegates that they have, have like, I think she only has to win 30% of the one that has to be very fun to vote. There are many kind of fiber. I mean, talk about what her feeling is. Give me something visually dynamic. If you're driving my car right now, We've been talking about yeah, rigged system. We're really putting, putting up right now a graphic. Bernie okay, Sanders, Sanders wins 56 to 44 percent. I mean, and why I have the delegates rewarded? Hillary Clinton 11, Bernie Sanders actually, 7. Just do it why is the Democratic Party even yeah. have voting? Yeah, votes? yeah exactly. You know, why? This it seems like too often the polls are rigged. Well, definitely, and I think it's, you know, they fall into lines so better than our voters do, but I can see that you might some of your same emotions and willing yeah, our that's best 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 But we always talk about yeah, voter turnout and how no other one I thought to do at our duty as a citizen. Really There's and absolutely no real. reason any of those people voted mm -hmm. in any of There's those things, I mean, right? I, what's the justification? Wait, Wait someone tell me. I don't tip on you. No, that's not fair. Tell me why those people need to go vote. Their votes don't matter. Question. Who lost by 12 percentage points everywhere? I'm not telling you. 
I did a mission, I advised the present franchise. So, all, I mean, it is a ring of system on the Democratic life. side, even mm -hmm. worse than the Republican side. No, this and I don't I feel know like the like Democratic There's so much stuff in this the rules? I'm going to acknowledge it a couple times. I put it in the I would say it's pretty much like one thing. It didn't have some big part in the water franchise except that one shot. I thought the one thing you would always see more know that the Trevlossy Null was hyping his appearance. CBS. I think this is the, the theme of next season. It's going to yeah. be, yeah, Amazing Race, Amazing Race 29, go gnome or go home. <laughs> Man, I, I don't know why they haven't hired us yet. <laughs> they just watch the show and steal our ideas. Yeah. Alright, so we, got, we probably have time for one final question here, and we've got one from The Elk Speaks who wants to know, is anyone else tired of all the flights that reset the standings this season on The Amazing Race? And we've talked about this a little bit, but I'd love to get a little bit more detail on that. Yeah, I have mixed feelings, because I, I sort of like sometimes putting in the airport stuff and letting them try to find their own flights. However, if it goes a certain way, it can totally sap the drama out of the whole episode. Because if some team screws up at the airport and then they're last, you spend the whole episode with them going, we can catch up, we can catch up, and then they never do. So I feel like, you know, it can work great, but it can't. But I do appreciate them at least some point making, like I like driving, make them do something else. Let's at least make them try sometimes. Yeah, I mean, Jess, you brought this up a myriad, myriad of times on previous podcasts. When, you know... When you do that, you have a double-edged sword of, yes, it can create great drama. And, you know, old-school TAR had a lot of scenes that just took place in airports. Sometimes they didn't even get to the destination country until, like, a third of the way through the episode because so much was centric on the airports. But then if you have teams that are great at it, see Colin and Christy in Season 5 or Charlotte and Myrna in Season 11, you're going to pull out way ahead of the rest of the pack and it's going to make for boring television. So I'd say, I'd go with what Dan said. Do it in moderation because... Especially when you sporadically put it up, that's also going to keep teams on their on their toes, I feel like. To say, like, well, we don't have things set out in front of me. I also like, I mean, I guess to split the difference, you could do what they do sometimes, which is like, hey, you have this flight already booked, but you have the option of searching for more options. 
Uh, because that at least says, like, hey, you're not going to be stuck behind. You're not going to be the gutsy grannies or Chester and Ephraim. But at the same time, you still have an option of being able to further your lead by going after another flight as well. Yeah, but you might be Ken Dixon in that scenario. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> yeah, no, I I definitely agree with that. Like, we want to we want to use it. We want people to be able to use their travel savvy, but we also want to keep it interesting. Like, we don't want somebody to be days and days ahead, and we don't want like. I mean, I think one of my favorite examples was I think it was season. 13 or 14 in Cambodia where one team was 24 hours behind and they kept cutting to them. It looked like it was the same time of day, but it was an entire day after. So, we Oh, yeah. And I, I think it was, was that, uh, like, Aja and Ty? It yes. might have been? Yes, it was. I couldn't remember their names, but yeah. So, we want to try to avoid that. Like, get everybody at least in the same place on the same day. And I think the cream does tend to rise to the top in those cases because, you know, We've had a lot of equalization points, but we've had a lot of the same teams in the back of the pack, and the same teams are in the front of the pack. So, yeah, you know, I think I think we have a very good balance here. Yeah, it's it's good good navigation skills. It it awards good teams, but doesn't make for great TV. And reality TV is always about finding that balance between rewarding actual merit and making for entertaining television. So, I feel like using it sparingly is kind of perfectly uh, it's perfectly living in kind of both of those realms. I do kind of love how over time the show kind of finds an equilibrium with regard to these things, like, and even, like, more than once, because very early on in the show you would have, like, several seasons where the third place team at the end of the race was so far behind that they didn't even get to finish, and now it's like they've overcorrected for a while, and now they're kind of, they're getting the happy medium, and that, that makes me very happy. All right, so do we have any final thoughts before we kind of let you guys all go for the night? No, I mean, I think this season is definitely on the upswing, um, the past couple of episodes specifically. So I'm hoping that with less teams around, with more teams to focus on, uh, and, you know, with people like Dana becoming more and more unhinged, I think it should lead to a really energetic uh, final few episodes, at least I hope so. I think we only have, what, like four episodes left? And it's felt like a long season just because we had that Three week break in the middle, uh, which has functioned like almost like three non elimination legs. So the season feels long, but it's actually going to wrap up fairly quickly. Yeah, I like to think that, you know, you know how people sometimes think the survivors are actually still on the island while the show is airing? I like to think those three weeks were just like non elimination legs that they spent in the airport. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's crazy that we've had, like, one elimination in the last six weeks because of the time off or something, and so it's made the season feel weird. And I agree with Mike, though. I, if I was, I'm not ready to rank this, but it has potential to at least move past some seasons or move forward if it finishes, like, the last few. But if it kind of falters a bit and we have, I don't know, I mean, I don't blame the cast mostly, but I don't know. They're going to cool places. I just hope they keep doing good tasks. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, Th and thank you, Jess, for having us on. It's always fun to get the the holy tarinity uh, back together to reminisce about old school seasons and talk about the current one as well. That's true. We're going to have to do our rankings all over again at the end of the season. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> we'll have to make it three hours again. Yeah, we just got, we have to keep improving upon our time every season that passes. <laughs> absolutely. All right, so. You guys can find Dan Heaton on Twitter at the Dan Heaton, and you can find Mike Bloom on Twitter at a Mike Bloom type. So you know, there's the Dan and a Mike, and you can find me at Haymaker Hattie. You can find Rob at Rob Sesterino, and you can find him next Friday with me as we will go into episode nine. There is no exit interview on Monday. I'm sure Rob's going to be relieved to see that, <laughs> and. Everybody else, um, have a great week, and I guess we'll just sign off now, and we will talk to you next Friday.